Whoa, what's up? Part two of our, um, what do we call it? Okay, welcome back. Part two of our kind of intro to welding technique or double pass welding. Uh, if you guys followed the first one, if you haven't followed the first one, I'll just go back and do it because I'm not going to really recap. I'm just going to lead right back into where we left off. So our part we are working on for this series right now, I think I mentioned in the first part that we should do something that also is chassis welding, uh, not just like bench welding because a lot of people can get good results welding on the bench, but it's a whole nother monster to get into a chassis. And weld things um, in all kinds of precarious positions and um, weld things in uncomfortable positions because that's the name of the game. Uh, for people that have ADHD, sometimes it's a little more uh, it's a little less difficult to weld when you're uncomfortable because you're able to focus um, under stress like that. But what we have here, this is our bumper, um, all compound rolled. This is for Vivian, our F100. Uh, everything is chromoly, inch and three quarter, 120 wall tube, uh, 125 or eighth inch chromoly plate. Everything is completely welded. Uh, the tubes are welded before the plate work goes in. The miter under the plate work and the tube is welded before that. So everything has complete 360 welding on it. The, the you know, something to consider too is that uh, we do need to have relief holes drilled in some of this because when you're, especially when you're doing that top pass, everything's already sealed and the, and the pressure will build up in there from the heat and it can spit back at you and it's just not a good time. So I'll probably pop a couple of those in, but first let's get through our prep for this thing right now. A good habit is there will be sanding and like finishing done before we start the cover pass or the second pass. I'm just gonna go back and forth on those. So deal with it, call it what you want. Uh, but you know, like anytime I try to get like any project, if we're say we're, you know, we're building this fuel cell out and then it comes time to, we have to sand something and then we wanna weld it or we wanna weld it and then sand it. I try to, clean the area because it just it dirties things up and it's the same thing like if i'm if i'm finishing out areas and i'm sanding stuff and we're putting dust or anything on here and i have rod sitting around then that's going to contaminate the rod uh, if there's like if you're doing templates and then you start sanding shit and you have all your circle guides out and everything then it's dirtying those up and making those grimy and in turn it's making them abrasive and they're going to wear quicker and it's just it's just uh, not a good habit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna clean the surface uh, with, you know, I can probably leave the blocks, but you know, get the drill, um, get some of this stuff out of here first, and then we will go back and we'll get through um, how we wanna prep. So obviously like last time we talked about the wire wheel, uh, 60 grit, three inch, um, all pneumatic stuff here, three inch surface conditioning, whoa, three inch surface, whoa. That one's gonna get me. Let's call that a surface conditioning disc, three inch, because I'm just not gonna be able to get that. Uh, six inch DA, 60 grit. Um, those are gonna be our components. And then obviously the acetone hiding out down there, that'll give us our final wipe. All right, just like we talked about before on episode one with the root passing, let's draw that same thing. So, you know, this is a close up of our plate work here. Uh, just like a 90 weld. And then this is where we have, now we've already established our root, right, which has, it's it's bonded the two parent materials, got penetration. And then we've got this, this root pass pretty much filled up diagonally in these junctions, right? And it's that same kind of program. It's a little hard to see, but that's all focusing, failing, focusing, failing. That's all kind of the same thing. Now, a lot of that fill on the plate work on this particular part, uh, you know, I probably have it a little above diagonal where it's cresting. Uh, and why I'm noting this is because the prep I like to do, and sometimes, you know, even that, that first hit, 
you might got a little drip like going over of weld um, over past the profile of your plate work so what I like to do is I like to completely remove some of this so in we'll, we'll sand the surface you know this surface and then we'll sand this surface and that'll remove any kind of um, you know surface upsets and then I'll come back and I'll sand a 45 and what you end up getting is you get a complete bonded weld and then you get a completely clean surface right here right now that's still not your weld could be stronger so then you come in with your cover and you can crest this thing and you can ensure that everything's completely tied together and it's either a little above uh, the surfaces here or it's just right tangent with them and a lot of like the the heavy pro dudes will have like that perfectly capped um, kind of weld going on you know so that's something to think about but the prep on there you like in turn you could just wire wheel it or not even wire wheel it. you could wipe it with acetone and just go through but there's so much room for error because a lot of like when you see any kind of gray that one's not terrible but you know some of that time when you see like the gray on top it, it, there's like a, a fog of contamination and like i mentioned it it turns up like when you hit that that second pass sometimes you'll have your your bead here or your pass and there'll be like little lily pads of contamination and usually what will happen is that same lily pad you'll start with it over here and it'll just kind of leave a little trail and then it'll it'll just kind of follow you all the way through and it'll just be this bullshit that you're chasing you can also kind of if you see that you can center punch it out and and it'll go away it'll kind of chip off like slag but the best possible chance for any of this stuff is just to give like a nice edge prep on this stuff and then go back now you can't really edge prep any of the tube stuff because you know you'd have to use some spooked out tooling uh, and just the time the edge prep for the plate work is not as bad especially time wise but once you start having to clean any of that that's a problem so really it's better to just try to get some kind of a clean like efficient root pass for your tube work and then wire wheel wire wheel wire wheel so right now I want to start with um, getting the plate work as prepped as I can um, the first step with that is taking the three inch 60 grit and you know facing any of the top or the vertical surfaces that I need and then going in and making a 45 right and it's the same with this this is the same thing we're talking about right so face you know the vertical or face the top without going into the actual material just removing any of the excess weld and then same thing just giving a nice like diagonal sand like a bevel uh, and that really gives you the, the highest chance for non-contaminated cover passes. Step one, beveled edges. So if you can get a visual on that, the, you know, it's just a 45 like we talked about. So top surface, side surface, and 45 bevel. And that's on both sides. So I don't really have, there's not really a lot of fall off on the weld where I need to get the sides. It was only here but everywhere else is smooth. So the next step I wanna do here is I want to get all the junctions, everything wire wheeled. Uh, every, everywhere where there, there is weld, I wanna hit with the wire wheel that pulls all the contaminant out um, and freshens them up. You know, just, just it'll get everything consistent. Uh, and that's kind of the name of the game. And then once we get the wire wheel done, uh, I'm just gonna just take the orbital sander or the DA and I'm gonna go through all the plate areas and kind of just fluff them back to normal so they don't look used and abused and they'll just be fresh. And then the haze or the heat affected zone, 
um, won't be doubled. It'll just it'll just be the top one. Kind of makes sense. So everything consistent, everything cleaned up. There's no graying. There's nothing to worry about. Just, you know, that's ready to hit. Um, same with all these areas. Just want to DA, like the cap, we'll, we'll DA, we'll put a good finish on there. And then the, the plate, we'll get everything we can. It's going to be a little tight in some of these spots, but it's not going to be anything crazy. Same with these caps. Just going to hit those again. But, you know, I think you get the gist of it. Everything's kind of fresh and ready. And prepped it's just like a clean canvas so I'm gonna flip this thing over I'll do the same process to the other side and then we will hit it the DA and go from there Okay, wire wheel done. So last step we want here, just get the DA. Obviously, I have a smaller one too, but I feel like the bigger diameter, it's like it's less of a footprint to the edge. Um, so it'll it'll pretty much get everywhere I need to here. Uh, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna swap the pad on this, put something fresh on, and then um, refinish this because this is actually gonna be the area that we weld first anyway. So we're just gonna take care of the box areas, and I'm also gonna take care of the caps. Like I mentioned. Yeah, I just take care of the caps too. One, two, three, four. So let's get it. You know, keep in mind with this stuff, like. You don't have to re-DA this stuff. You don't have to sand these edges. It's just to give yourself the best, cleanest chance on a lot of like your plate work stuff for sure. Just taking any chance of con contamination out and then also bringing consistency into that edge. That's a huge help. Okay. Analog machine is set up right there 20 foot leads I'm gonna start attacking the plate work like we talked about all the prep is done on this stuff open canvas for welding um, I do need to wipe this stuff down with acetone right now and then we're final um, I kind of have my blocks set up for hand uh, placement and comfort and then this is also kind of a prop to not have this thing teeter-totter every little movement once you're welding like i said even just moving your hands is one thing but also like the the material or the part will start to kind of chatter or um vibrate sometimes you know through like the arc and uh you just want to stabilize everything like the best you can and especially if you're if you're leaning on this thing or putting pressure like while welding, you will might not even know until they start moving on you, and then obviously you're gonna scratch your weld. So that's that. Um, I'm gonna start going. I'm gonna hit this line first. Probably do the whole thing and jump over like back forth, back forth, back forth, and if you know 
and maybe start some of these other intersections that aren't uh, intersecting with the plate work because I do want to weld out like we talked about having a um, like a story to tell like the you weld the plate area first and it looks like that got welded and then it went into the tube structure and then weld it you know to the tube structure so there's like a lot of pathways here you can choose uh, for design aesthetic too so something else to think about uh, when welding areas like this if I can get a point where I'm trying to see if I can you can kind of see how I'm looking at this thing if there is a way where I can weld and say say I'm welding this corner where I can weld I'm really uncomfortable because I'm leaning over the whole table in the bumper but if I can where I can see not just the front but I can also see the the tail of the weld after the cup then I can kind of be in check with my consistency um, you know because every time there's input of the rod is really where you get that overlap something else too that, that I press on for myself is really consistent tight spacing um, I think you know it's a lot easier to make like gapped out spacing where it's more like scaly or uh, dimes but consistency where it's tighter I really believe is a stronger weld because there's no upset like and what I mean by that <clears throat> all right so Let's say this is your material. Right, you're, this is your, that's essentially your fillet weld. And then when you're stacking, you know, if you stack, like a big stack, and this is very exaggerated, you guys, but like I say that's your puddle each time. This inconsistency where it goes in and it leaves this edge and even if that's you know if you make it smaller if you have this you know there's all of these little areas here are pockets where you've just made a very serrated edge um, of contact between the parent metals or the parent material each piece so running a stack Oh my god, that was terrible. So running a stack where it's tighter renders more straight of an edge. And that straighter edge is less prone to cracking than something like this. That's yeah, just obviously like common sense here. So instead of this stack, I might try to triple that and have it, let's call it quadruple, right? So that edge becomes much more minimal than having that jagged shit, right? And so that's my whole point on that. Now on top of that, when you powder coat stuff, it's beautiful because it almost just looks like a perfect continuous seam. You don't even see the upset because as much as it's cool to see like a bead and stacking, the end result, like it looks like something's jagged. Uh, when it's finally coated, you know, and it's, it's got it's very, you know, like either powder coat or paint on it, you see more upset than you do anything else. And if you kind of look at some of the, like the ES Motorsports chassis, um, the uh, Porter chassis, Gordon chassis, a lot of that welding, some of the Everson chassis too, uh, very tightly spaced. And I've always looked up to that stuff. And that's what I value for like a proper weld um, than just like stacked, you know, spaced out stuff. So this is our setup we're going to work with. And I tried this already. I don't know how, what kind of success we're getting with this thing. But I just put a little auto dimmer hit on this thing. And then I put this right up to the lens. That's kind of the best approach I have at this to try to see. I haven't done any research or looked into like what you can use to film welding. So. This is what we're gonna run for now until further notice and I'll probably have some good insight. Maybe you guys can comment on what would be optimal for this versus what we're doing. But this is kind of our setup. So my first hit, uh, I'm gonna run run this down and go across 
I'll probably be operating torch from this from this side and then I'll have hand over here. Uh, we'll see what we get. For this application, I am running uh, 045 rod uh, versus our 1 16th that we were using for the fill. So the cover, you know, the 045 will burn a lot hotter, but it also won't fill so much um, where it drips over and kind of runs off the edge. to get uncomfortable. I'm just gonna kind of focus. I'm trying to get as long as you're running as you can before you start doing stuff that makes you so uncomfortable that it affects the, the process of the welding. Again, finding where you're comfortable here. The spacing is always hard too to get really tight because. You really have to move at a snail's pace with your hand. Um, it always feels like you're covering minimal ground, and then when you know you look, you're like, dude, I was still spaced out. And so you have to like really slow down your what your thoughts are, like your perspective is on how far you're moving each time to like when you're sliding your hand to get the spacing tight. And then every time I'm gonna come to a stop, like right now. I'm gonna let the argon and the post flow pull the weld and a little bit of the rod. Kinda, again, you know, doing that test hit, figuring out, like the, this thing's already sliding, I'm gonna wanna clamp it. I'm gonna fudge it right now to get through this, but then I'm gonna clamp it. But right now I'm kinda looking at like my slide, right? How's that gonna go first? And I know I'm gonna have to slide physically with my hand here. Start back up and kind of do a little overlap when I start to stop. Sometimes I'll hit that pedal hard. You can probably hear it. And it really gives me like a tempo. Um, to focus and kind of be on track each time, almost like a metronome. Um, I never played any instruments, but I know like, you know, music, like holding a tempo with music um, is a thing. And I always like, I, it's like a reset every time. It kind of lets me know and it keeps the consistency for me. Yeah, I'm gonna adjust my hand because I know this run's gonna be a little tricky, so I'm gonna come out of that little pocket. Trying to find what's optimal for like letting you guys see that, and I just, I don't know if this is even our best program, but at least you can kind of see the weld versus just seeing a big ass bright light if I didn't have that screen on there. I also like need to figure out how to position myself to not be in the way I think we're gonna get this one so let's try it here I'm a little uncomfortable I'm standing on my tippy toe here but we're all right
I can see the front just to kind of give me guidance on direction and make sure I'm not being too wobbly of a weld. But really, I'm checking out the back. Whoa, what? And I'm seeing kind of where my tails of each puddle are, are divided. And that's going to check my, like, space on all this stuff. Whoops, sorry. So letting it cool. Cool. No point for that. Something I've talked about before is kind of that overlap with the welding to display like the construction of it. There's ways, you can see this is the passes we've been working on. Pretty consistent. And obviously that's what we started with, right? Is this our fully prepped edge? Uh, but what I wanted to touch on really quick is kind of this overlap process. So, you know, everything's been 360 welded. Like before this, this plate structure went on, we had the miter welded under here because that was this was our primary tubes, right? Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary or third structure. Uh, so one, two, three. Uh, and th the same with like our, our final pass. So everything's been rooted under here. But you can see there's like some sloppy dick shit and then some consistent shit. And really now it's the time to make this proper so like the miter like and that's why so i i started i did our hit here and i'm gonna let this cool a little bit and do this other hit i'll jump around right because this side's untouched but i know that this miter junction needs to wrap around and land on the other side and that's our first weld and then what else i can do is i can come from in here and i can rip this weld all the way into here because i know that's going to be our second tube that we welded and then the third piece that would go in would be this. So once I have these seams welded or the edges welded of this structure, then I'm gonna come around and rip and I'm gonna glue that all together just so it, the construction looks proper. Some people, they will weld, and this is totally based on like your style and technique of how you want the aesthetics to look in the final. But some people will just like shameless, you know, like bra bra bra, or they'll like just weld whatever they want. You know, but it doesn't really tell the story of the construction of the part. So we'll kind of touch on that some more, but I did, I have both sides of this plate work welded uh, on the underside, and then I started to zip this, and then on the other side, on this guy, I started to zip from the other way because I just know the direction of how I need to weld is gonna be that way. So a lot of this is like thinking about that process in advance and not welding too much or welding areas that are gonna compromise like your final story of, of how that welding is. Okay, so we're kind of partially through here. 
Uh, I did reserve the uh, final pass on this interior portion of the plate work just because things were hot, so I kind of jumped around. Got some pretty good wins here on stuff. Uh, you know, I've just been, like I said, I'm jumping and I know where my overlap's gonna be, so same like with this portion, right? I'll, I will rip this and then I've already done the backside, so now I can carry through and draw this one over because this one will have an overlap because the tube fitment is right to center line touching. Um, same with this. I knew the miter needed to be done first, so so we got the miter portion done, and then I knew that this tube was my secondary, so I ripped that, and then we know that this structure, once I weld this interior seam, then this will wanna be welded here. So I kinda hope that overlap thing makes sense to you guys. Uh, same program over here. Same deal. So rip that one through, uh, miter through, and then we'll finish. Right now I have this turned over, it's not hot now. Uh, but we will get this going first, and then I'll probably jump back over to here, rip that, just to kind of let the stuff cool. The other thing uh, to use for cooling is just use air. If you want to sit here, and, you know, and just put, maybe you can put some uh, like, like hearing protection on or some like earmuffs, and then just sit and cool. And you do that for minutes on end. Um, it's something, you know, a lot of this, like I said, it takes patience. Uh, and when you're trying to run through this stuff, it does like, it cripples you on timing. But when you want to get like a good end result, um, letting this stuff cool per section, and then coming back and ripping it again, and then when it's hot, you know, cooling it back down or jumping around, that's a, a really important part of this whole program.
pretty close. Uh, I have a couple sections, so all this stuff's pretty dialed. There is like one pass left over here. I'm gonna lay this thing over. So if you guys can see kind of the overlap that I'm talking about, our main, so our, our first, our second, and then our third hit. So you can see it kind of there's there's like runoff, right? That weld kind of runs off and then gets buried and overlapped and drawn on top of. So one part I do want to touch on still is the caps. Um, the caps are always tricky. All these that we're going to look at right now, I, I have used rod on, but sometimes I will. If I, if I know there's enough filler material already, like on the root and it's not sanded down or something, I'll sit there and I will like hold the torch and fusion right over the end caps. If it's not like a structural piece and I know there's nothing that's going to tie into you making it fail, uh, cheat it, you know? But never, that's the one thing, like some of these guys will, they'll go and like they'll, they'll make a nice fill, like a cover pass, might not be, be perfect or how they want it. And then they'll sit there and they won't use rod and they call it like airbrushing. And they'll just hold the torch and they'll just foot pulse and hold that torch super steady and not put any rod into it, no filler material. And that definitely does um, cripple the integrity and the strength of the weld and I never do that. Um, it is only for a cap, maybe, you know, so I'm gonna flip this over and kind of look at the caps that we have right now And then um, get you whoa, and then get you that Demo on whatever we have left because I think like one of these is just not done. There we go. I see it <clears throat> All right, look what we got So this is our cap this caps pretty dynamic it's kind of like a teardrop. It's got a break in it, so it has a, a, you know, a directional or a surface change on here. So it's much more elongated and it does a lot of different stuff where it's not a consistent surface to weld into. But you can see where I started. I hope this thing is focusing. I can't tell because the, the screen is kind of small. You know, I started it and then I've just ripped it around. And then I ended here. So I do still have this cap to do like the half of this portion. But you can see I, I chose like also like the start stop. Uh, I've chosen, come on dude, focus. I choose where that start stop is because no matter what, when you end that weld, it does, it, unless it's getting like, like welded on top of, then you're gonna have like a very obvious start stop. And what I chose is the bottom of the bumper. So you know how this thing is, this is the very bottom of the bumper. Like you'd have to look under the truck to see that start stop. So everything on the top, you see and it's visual, but you don't have to see that breakup. And that's the same thing I chose here. So obviously like this, this is the bottom of the bumper. And I chose to have that same program where it starts here and I'll wrap it and then I'll drop right around and then boom in there. And that's all the bottom of the car. And this one's done.
here's our cap. It's kind of our piece we had. A lot of failed focusing. And you can see where the start stop is on the end here. I went ahead and sent some of this stuff too. But you can see we're pretty wrapped. Okay, we're pretty wrapped up. I have these breather holes, just like an eighth inch hole uh, in some areas, kind of as a, just a, a pressure relief hole on some of the parts here. I'm gonna fill those. A lot of times if I am going to fill those and it's like on a really like a part that needs to be clean and not have that visible fill, um, I'll do it strategically where I have a lot of room like runoff to, to sand the area. Like I might put it on the tube way up high that's still in the prep area so that, you know, then when I fill it, I can still kind of fluff and buff and then re-prep the area and it doesn't look like it's there. Now this stuff I did strategically where I don't have as much attachment to sanding that stuff uh, for visual purposes. This whole thing is a bumper that's a contact bumper. It's for getting beat to shit. So uh, I'm just gonna leave those holes filled, um, no sanding, uh, and then close this thing out. This thing's kind of wrapped up. That wraps up our, well, our second part of our multi-part series here on welding. Oh uh, man, you know, this really, I think it's tricky to navigate this. I'm probably gonna have to watch it and listen to you guys and listen to your comments as far as, um, you know, what we missed or what we should stress on more. But I think some of the important stuff to take from this is the actual process, you know, the, the prep process, that's, that's what would probably be most important. Um, the cups, uh, the use of the 12 cups, and you know, the use of the rod size, and uh, the application for that, look at these ugly ducklings. And really, um, just technique, you know, I think also like the method of overlaps on this stuff, uh, that's something really to, to take from here. So there's a lot of process. Um, we also like, I use that auto darken screen in front of the camera. I don't even know what these results are gonna look like. So a lot of this will just be trial and error. Um, and a lot of it will touch back and revise just to get something optimal. But um, you know, one last thing. Some people call this ego juice or ego spray. Um, I don't like how welds look with WD-40 on them, but it definitely does something and it does, it does preserve the metal. Like, you know, if you're wondering like, oh, how do you, you know, if you're building something and you wanna preserve the steel and the appearance of it throughout the build without it getting rusty. Um, whoa, Wiley. My goodness, oh shoot, goodness gracious. Oh goodness, just living, living. Um, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Some people use SC1. I don't like SE1 as much. I don't think it does what WD-40 does. So let me give you that, that quick hit of, of what this Ego spray does. You ready? Let's get these guys going. Get this whole setup going. Let me come through with the wipe. like taking a Photoshop picture and bumping up the contrast or something. Right, you kind of see what we got now. I don't know. It kind of mutes the colors to me. I hope some of this stuff was helpful to you guys. Oh, like I said, I need to cover more welding stuff. 
We have aluminum to do. Um, we have just, I think, basics. Like, I'd like to get uh, some kind of apparatus where we can really, you can see the welding and there's that's gonna be easy to find because a lot of people do welding demos. So it's not gonna be a struggle for us to figure it out. Um, but again, you know, thank you for watching. Uh, again, stop saying again. I hope you got something from this thing. Take what you need and leave the rest. Welding is that controversial hit, right? Everybody's got crazy opinions. So um, right or wrong or good or bad, this is how I do things. This is how we do things in the shop. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks.